These are the things that I wish someone would have told me sooner to save some degree of stress and money. Have you ever heard the saying that purchasing a house can be one of the most stressful things in life? I guess it's true when things go wrong, which is quite often. It's a huge moment, especially if it's your first house. And learning from my personal experience and seeing others, I've put together the top 10 mistakes you should avoid when buying a house. Firstly is letting emotions control your offer price. This depends on the property market. Right now, things are trending down and it's a lot easier to get properties below the asking price. But just remember, asking price is not the same as market value. It could be, but estate agents like to milk their chances and so do sellers. Who wouldn't want to get the top price possible? When the market is hot like we saw in 2022, don't get caught up in these silly bidding wars where the price goes way above what any neighbour has paid in recent years based on today's current market values. Do your research, understand the prices on that street by looking at sold prices on Rightmove or go to mouseprice.com and check out some data there. The key here is not looking at the current listed properties because they are the asking prices not the sold prices. So what you're doing here is avoiding a scenario where the bank surveyor comes around for the mortgage and then they downvalue the house because you overpaid for what it's worth. This means that you either have to renegotiate with the seller or you have to front the extra cash, which puts yourself at massive risk of negative equity. If another buyer is being silly and pushing up the price, know when to walk away because there's plenty of other great houses out there and it's not worth sinking yourself into extreme affordability. Secondly is letting the property survey scare you. When you get a level two RIC survey known as the home buyer's report, they're, they're sort of useful, but People often put a lot of emphasis on them. Surveyors have to cover everything for their liability insurance. If they get it wrong, you can effectively claim against their insurance for anything they've missed. This means that they'll go into silly levels of detail over things that really don't matter. And that can sometimes worry people and put them off buying a property. When putting offers on houses last year, I put an offer on a house that was beautiful, Victorian property, it had wooden floors, had great ceilings and we were against a first time by a couple and they went very, very high on their offer, which was good for them. They got the winning bid. But then when I was talking to the seller, I said, look, here's our offer. We're also not scared of the survey. I'm gonna take it with a pinch of salt and most of the things won't really worry me unless it's incredibly structural and there's genuinely something wrong. Lo and behold, a few months later, the seller got back in touch and they were saying that their buyers had pulled out because the survey had scared them. I actually warned the seller about this and told them that was part of our offer was that we wouldn't be put off by it. And of course the inevitable happened. Surveyors effectively rank their surveys based on the severity of the defect to give you an idea of what's important and what's not. For example, I've had reports before where they flagged warnings about wonky paving in the back garden or paving that's 50 years old and has some weeds growing through it, which yes, can be helpful, but everything is fixable. And here is an example of a survey that I had done on a buy to let property where they gave a rating of three, which is the highest severity. It talks about cracks, damp, blown plaster, and it sounds quite bad, when actually this specific house was plastered directly onto bricks with no plasterboard. So imagine putting mud on your face and letting it dry, then move your face and all of that mud cracks. Similarly to a house, as it gets cold in the winter and hot on a sunny day, the materials expand and contract, which have the exact same effect. So everything was superficial and there's nothing to worry about. The remarks about damp and blown plaster was because the plaster, from what we could work out, was original. So it had been there since 1950 and over 70 years old. So of course it was a little bit knackered. Now I don't advocate ignoring cracks because they can be serious, but don't let them scare you. Take it with a pinch of salt. Unless there is huge evidence of a massive crack running all the way through the bricks, then I would personally take it with a pinch of salt and not let it put me off a potential beautiful property. Next is going cheap on conveyancing. Now this is a bit of a personal one. We've just bought a new house and I made the humongous mistake of not going with a qualified and good solicitor. I sold my London flat through Strike, which is an online estate agent, very similar to Purple Bricks. And these types of companies, although might be great for the selling bit, do not let them upsell their conveyancing services to you. It's outsourced to companies like the Simplify Group, which own multiple brands like Premier Property Lawyers, JS Law, and loads more. They usually have these shiny, 
online portals and mobile apps. And if they've got shiny apps and portals, then do not use them. It's usually a sign of these conveyancing firms where they're not actually qualified solicitors. And instead, case handlers do it all, meaning they go through a checkbox process and one qualified solicitor might be handling about 70 cases and only sign it off at the end. I had eight months of hell because of Premier Property Lawyers. Poor communication, sheer incompetence, losing emails, losing documents, repeating questions, asking ridiculous, unnecessary inquiries. They cost me hundreds of pounds in expiring valuations, surveys, leasehold documents, and we were eight days from the sale collapsing due to the buyer's mortgage expiring. And really frustratingly, these companies gaslight you when the customers complain. They're just big factories for house purchasers and have no idea of customer service. So if you want the stress, don't go for them. Their trust pilot is full of real stories from people sharing how companies like these have caused entire chains to collapse purely down to their incompetence and slowness. But then weirdly full of five-star reviews that all follow a similar pattern that to me smells like fake reviews. The best thing to do here is go to Google Maps, search property solicitors and read all the positive and negative reviews. But I'd always now go for a local established firm with strong real reviews and who don't have the shiny apps and portals, but instead do it over email. They're your classic qualified competent firm. It might cost more, but that being said, price isn't necessarily tied to service, but just don't go for one of these big online firms where you have to communicate to a central mailbox. Just don't do it. Next is not researching the local area. Most people know the area they're buying in. If you don't, that's a good place to start. What's the local town like? If you've got hobbies, what can you do with them in the local area? But for me, it's the little things. I regret my London flat being next to a super noisy main road. We had buses going up and down constantly, police cars, knobs with loud exhausts. And it also meant that in the summer, when it got super hot with it being a new build, opening the door wasn't the most peaceful of things. Even when house hunting recently to move out of London, there was one house. It was a Victorian Gothic house, but there was a bus stop outside. And when I checked the timetable of the buses, they ran up to midnight every single day. And with it being an old property, it had wooden single glazed windows that can't be replaced because it's protected in a conservation area. And with the main bedroom on the front, I just knew it would annoy me with idling bus engines. Another one is things like nurseries and school playgrounds. Don't underestimate the noise generated from a school playground. And if you're buying a new build, I found this in new build estates more than anything else. A lot of them at the moment tend to be near motorways and A roads on old farmland. Again, here, don't underestimate the noise of a motorway because you will never escape it if it's something that annoys you. And lastly is thinking about where you are. I love picking on new build estates because they're all the same. A lot are in the middle of nowhere, no shops nearby, no local pub, no coffee shop. What is it that matters to you in the local area? Having moved from London, I wanted parks to walk in, trees, and also awesome independent coffee shops, bars, restaurants, and all nearby and walkable, which was really important in that search. And people forget to think about this and just get caught up in the house itself. Next is not thinking about your true affordability. First thing first is speak to a mortgage broker. Let them assess your finances and work out what your maximum affordability is. Then knock a bit off so that you're not maxing yourself out, especially in this market at the moment. By understanding what you can afford, you can narrow your searches on Rightmove and Zoopla and remove some of that noise that might be distracting you a little bit. But even when you have a mortgage in principle or agreement in principle, remember to think about council tax, bills, maintenance, food, cars, and all your other living expenses. Whenever I am buying a house, I jump onto Google Sheets or Excel and calculate what my budget would be monthly and how does my mortgage payments impact my savings ability every month? Are there any financial risks? Am I stretching myself too far? my personal priority is still saving as much as possible. So it was crucial not to go too crazy with a mortgage because the repayments would be a killer and just eat into my ability to invest into a stocks and shares ISA. And also think about today's affordability versus tomorrow. The cost of everything is going up. There's a lot of people this year coming off cheap 1.5% fixed rate mortgages and jumping onto rates of 7%, massively wiping out their affordability. So consider mortgage rates in a few years as well. If it was a little higher than today, could you still afford it? Next is not checking out local planning permission. Now this is very important and it's hugely underrated. If you're putting an offer 
on a house, check the local planning to see if anything is happening that could ruin your perfect house. If you've got a nice field view on the back, our Taylor Wimpy about to build loads of new houses overlooking into your back windows. Has a nuclear power plant been approved down the road? It's a good sense check to make sure nothing is out of the ordinary that might have triggered the sellers to sell at that point. I always treat every seller very suspiciously to understand what are their motivations to sell a house and why are they selling and are there any hidden reasons. Now, yes, a solicitor will look at the basic view of this during their searches, but you should go onto the planning portal for the local council and check all the neighbours in extreme detail. But it also means that you can see what your neighbours on the street have done, what they've had approved, and when it comes to extensions, if there is a NIMBY neighbour objecting to everything, you can be very well aware of them. But it's a good way to get inspiration if you do think about extending your home and adding value in the future. Next is if buying a leasehold property, go through it with a fine comb. I have a friend, Charles, who was recently buying a flat in London. He was a first time buyer and was going through the whole process and very close to the point of exchanging, he went onto the Facebook group of the development and he found residents talking about doubling ground rent clause in the paperwork. Lo and behold, he looked through the draft lease of the flat he was buying and found the same doubling ground rent clause that his solicitor had missed. Now, this is part of a wider leasehold scandal and the government have actually banned doubling clauses on any new leasehold properties, but they still exist on older leasehold flats typically. It means the ground rent gets more and more expensive and it means in future the ground rent becomes so high that the property becomes unmortgageable for the lender because it's so unaffordable relative to its price. Also, you need to check things like admin fees, service charges, and make sure there is nothing out of the ordinary. When I was selling my leasehold flat, I had to pay 450 pounds for a legal pack to be created by the managing agent for the freeholder. It was a standard template pack with my service charge history and definitely not worth 450 pounds worth of time. There's also other things like the length of the lease. Anything under 80 years may be considered short and cause mortgage issues in the future. Look at things like permissions and what can you change? If you're looking for a doer upper project, can you change the internal walls and non-structural elements? Or do you need permission for everything from the freeholder? Is there cladding? And if there is, and it's a high rise building, does it have an EWS1 certificate that doesn't need any remedial works? Number eight is forgetting to budget for your furniture. So you've found an amazing property. You've made the offer and you're about to get the keys. But don't underestimate the furniture. To furnish a three bedroom house can cost a few thousand pounds that you might not have thought of. A sofa, 700 pounds, TV, 400 pounds, white goods, a bed, a mattress, it all adds up very quickly. And when I was furnishing my first flat, I actually got a 0% credit card from Barclay Card for two years, meaning I paid no interest. So it was basically like a free loan. And then I just paid it back off monthly to split the costs. I did have the money, but I wanted to keep it in my stocks and shares ISA because it would earn more in there than it would with a 0% credit card. Places like Ikea are great to shop around, but to be fair, even Ikea is getting expensive nowadays. They're not as cheap as they used to be, so you still go in and walk out with a receipt as long as your arm and hundreds of pounds lighter just from buying plants and candles. Number nine is not thinking forwards. Let's say you've just got married and you're looking for your first home and you get a two bedroom place. That's great. But if you work from home, naturally one room would be the bedroom and the other would be the office. If you then have a child and then that needs to be converted all of a sudden into a bedroom, your office is probably then going to be in the living room and everything begins to feel more cramped. The big question is, what are you buying your house for? Is it a two, three year thing? Is it a do or upper and move on project? Or is it a forever home? It's important to think about the plans and the space because You'd be surprised how quickly you grow out of a house, whether you need more bedrooms, a bigger garden, or a driveway for two cars or schools nearby. Otherwise, you might be in a position where you have to go through the stress all over again and the cost of moving to change into a house, which suits your new needs in a few years time. And lastly is not being prepared when making offers on properties. You need to show estate agents that you're serious, even more so in a hot property market. When I make an offer, I always attach RIDs, proof of funds, mortgage in principle, and then attach the details of both my mortgage broker and solicitor who are ready to go. It shows that you know what you're doing and that you're ready to go. And if there are other bidders on a property, it'll show the agent that you're more prepared and you're substantiated in your offer and that you can definitely proceed with it and you have all of your stuff together. Because at the end of the day, 
They want an easy, stress-free sale to get their money. So you're giving them that confidence. And there you have it. There are lots of things that make a house at home. And really, just do as much due diligence as you can into the house that you're buying from planning and its location and nearby amenities. You have to question what is it that's most important to you to happily live somewhere because there's nothing more miserable than living somewhere that you're not happy in. If you enjoyed this video, then you can check out this one here, which is why it's so hard for first time buyers right now to purchase their first home. So click on this video here and I will see you in the next video.